Before we begin to talk about the Middle East, let's first define what we mean by the Middle East. Where exactly is it? Well, scholars debate about where it is exactly, but Van de Graaff has done a great job helping us understand what most scholars think of when they refer to the region as the Middle East. Listen to what he has to say. In the 1800s, this area of the world was called the Far East by Europeans, since it was far away and to the east. The Near East generally meant the lands controlled by the Ottoman Empire, since it was nearer to Western Europe, but still to the east. Depending on who you asked, the Near East could be either the whole Ottoman Empire, just the Levant, or in some cases, just the Balkans. Turns out arbitrary geographic terms tend to be arbitrary. The Middle East, therefore, could be anywhere in between the Near and Far East, but for some reason, the modern definition seems to cover almost all of what was called the Near East. The term Middle East was popularized in the 1902 book titled The Persian Gulf and International Relations, which explained the strategic importance of the region, particularly for the British who wanted to protect their India colony from Russian influence. Keeping the sea lanes open between the Suez Canal and India was critical to tying the empire together. Depending on the exact definitions, this Middle East may or may not have intersected with the Near East. But with the fall of the Ottoman Empire, some people expanded the definition of the Middle East to include the old Ottoman lands. However, many still kept calling the area the Near East. In English, the term Middle East won out because in World War II, the British Army called their forces in the area the Middle East Command. The command fought many battles in the Middle East and in Africa as the war progressed. After the war, the term Middle East continued to grow in usage due to events like the 1956 Suez Crisis, various regional wars, and the 1979 Iranian Revolution, and subsequent oil shocks, while the terms Near and Far East fell out of favor. This means the world currently has a Middle East, but no real reason for it to be the Middle. Even though it does not make much sense anymore, much of the world, including the Middle East itself, have adopted the term. Presently, the terms Middle East and Near East are interchangeable in English, with Middle East being dominant. But for example, in German, Near East is the dominant term. Let me know in the comments what you consider to be the Middle East, and what you call it in your native language. Also, you might be interested in watching this video I made, which explains Thank you, the Mandy difference Graf. between the- So, now that we've established where the Middle East is, let's talk about those living in the Middle East. The largest religion in the Middle East is Islam, and those who live by the tenets of Islam we call Muslims. And as you can see, there are 1.8 billion Muslims worldwide. Now that's roughly 24% of the global population, which makes Islam the second largest religion. Now there were 1.8 billion Muslims in 2015 which makes, according to that research, Islam is the fastest growing major religion. And if that demographic trend continues, Muslims will exceed the number of Christians by the end of this century. Now you can see by this map, by the dark green areas where the lion's share of Muslims live, up there in Northern Africa, all along the Mediterranean, and all the way to uh, Pakistan. Now, if Having said that, what would you expect is the number one name in the world? Ponder that for a moment. That's right. Muhammad is the most common name in the world. Why is such a big population? Well, at least one reason could be due to the fact that Muslim women have an average of 2.9 children compared with 2.2 for all other groups combined. Now, where we have a divorce rate of 50% plus here in the West, they have only 10%. Now, out of 100 people in your country, how many do you think are Muslims? Uh, there's, there's less than you think. Ponder that for a minute. Again, if you were to guess how many Muslims per 100 in your country, what would you suspect? Well, if you look here, you can see if here in the United States, the average guess was 17, but there's only one Muslim per hundred. Wow. Now, though there are fewer Muslims living here in the U.S. and elsewhere as well, we live in an increasingly globally interdependent world. So what happens in the Middle East affects our world, and what happens in our world affects their world. So as you know, the Middle East is rife with oil, 
compared with the rest of the world. You can see those red dots where all the oil fields are in the Middle East. And though the Middle East has only 7% of the world's population, it holds 69% of the world's petroleum reserves. I remember as a kid, two separate oil crises, one in 1973 when I was in, in grade school, and one in 1979 when I was in, in high school. When OPEC, that stands for Organization of the Petroleum Exporting Countries, they band together and they kind of flex their muscles and disrupted oil supplies. And I remember drivers frequently faced round-the-block lines when they tried to fill up. Drivers would go to stations before dawn or late at night, hoping to avoid lines. And there were even odd, even rationing was, was introduced. If the last digit on your license plate was odd, you could get gas only on odd number days. And there were signs out in front of gas stations. Some gas stations took to posting flags. Green if they had gas, yellow if they were rationing, red if they were out of gas. And to conserve gas, the maximum speed was reduced to 55 mile, miles an hour. And a lot of people didn't like that. And I think that's what inspired Sammy Hagar to sing this. Love that do. Okay, so because of globalization, what happens when one part of the world affects our world? Iraq invades Kuwait, America invades Iraq, including other nations as well. Al-Qaeda attacks America, America attacks Al-Qaeda in Iraq. Well, they thought Al-Qaeda was in Iraq, actually it was a mistake. Because Syria's president fired chemical weapons at rebels, the US president fires on 2, Syria. 2,000 times by the US Navy from Syria to Sudan missiles. to Serbia, and all the new Tomahawk... 66 Tomahawk missiles were fired. By the way, those missiles cost $1.1 million apiece. Do you know that? Well, just recently, drone attacks... There were drone attacks on Saudi oil pipelines. Terrorists who were allegedly linked to Iran uh, were talked about in the news and the media. And then the U.S. president here in America... These That's are the this. latest pictures showing additional U.S. military personnel deployed to the region, a move to counter what the U.S. says are threats from Iran. Tensions climbed on Sunday. The platform, Twitter. So no part of the world, according to the U.S. press and Iran, is more important to our well-being at the moment, and no part of the world or the world religions of the world is more hopelessly and systematically and stubbornly misunderstood by us. Now, but not only does present day Middle East affect us today, but even ancient Middle East affects us. We have already been affected by Christianity and Judaism and Islam, which comes from the Middle East, and not to mention everyday words like uh, cotton comes from Arabic chuten, and pajamas, sandals, captain, we wouldn't have those if it wasn't for the Arabic, for the Muslim people. Uh, apricots, artichokes, ginger, lemon, lime, orange, saffron, sugar, tangerine, shish kebabs, hummus, and yogurt. And alcohol. Did you know that came? That's an Arabic word. Julep, and mint julep is Persian word, uh, julab, or rose water. Uh, algorithm, azimuth, algebra, mask and mascara derived from the Arabic word full. When Muslims conquered Spain in the early 8th century, their influence spread all over the country, including their language. And so, if you didn't know if you knew this, but guitar, the word guitar goes back via Spain to Arabs, kit, kit, probably Qatar. Uh, Alco from Alcuba, a domed area. Tariff comes from Al Tarif, which means list of prices. Almanac from Almanac meaning weather. Uh, some of your homes, some of you from uh, Arizona, New Mexico, California, and other places where there are Spanish-style homes. This came from Spain. And uh, that influence started 8th century on to the 15th century. The word Haman, bath, in Arabic. Uh, soap and daily bathing were habits discovered by the Crusaders in Palestine after they began their invasion in 1095 AD. Now, now, while the tradition of public baths were popularized, 
popularized under the Romans, slowly it died out in the West, but it continued over many centuries in different uh, Middle East countries. By the medieval period, public baths have become an important part of the, the community life in some of the Middle East countries, and the quality and number of baths counted among the city's most admired attributes. Medieval authors mention hamans alongside mosques and madrasas, madrasa is a school, and gardens in their descriptions of beautiful and prosperous cities. Hilal al-Sabi, for example, he wrote that in Baghdad, at its height, there were 60,000 plus bathhouses. This is a Moroccan uh, haman or bath. Now, not only do crusaders improve their hygiene, but they also improved their table manners because when they were on their crusades, they discovered from the Arabs, they discovered forks and knives. Instead of eating with their hands, they began to eat with these utensils. Now, the Muslim world has made an impact that still affects our world today. For example, they learned to perfume, uh, make perfume distilled from roses. So there was perfume in Persia long before it ever came to Paris. And today their world is influencing our way in other little ways. Little, for example, the burgeoning moving industry in the Middle East has begun to, to move our way. For example, the movie Thebe, nominated for an Academy Award. Just a little clip from it. <laughs> فلا يلحق مداه والبحر يذيب ما كل رجل يعصره والخوي لا من بدالك لا تخيب له رجعه كون يمه في يمينه بل مراجل واصلة وذيابه لو بدت ما تحقق لك نجاة كلهم ما ينفعونك والمنايا حاصلة like a great movie. Now, what other ways have the Middle East, has the Middle East affected our world? Well, many other ways. But my objective with this class is to answer some questions that naturally come to mind when we think about Muslims and Islam and the Middle East. What is Islam? Do all Muslims hate America? What is ISIS? How did they start? What do they believe? Where are they today? And how are they different from Hamas and Hezbollah? an Islamic Jihad group, Jabhat al-Nusra, and al-Qaeda, and al-Nusra Front. And what's written on their flags? Why are they different? What do their flags say exactly? And we'll talk about some of the places they come from and where they're located. How is the Quran, or what is the Quran, and how is Allah different or different than God the Father or Jesus Christ? The Quran speaks of Jesus, but does it speak of his atonement? Did you know the Quran speaks of Adam and Eve and Moses, Abraham, Jesus Christ, and Mary? How did the Muslim community spread and form and grow so fast? What were their empires? What were their states? And what's the difference between Sunni and Shia Muslims? Why do they fight each other? Is one better than the other? And what scientific contributions did Muslims make in the world? We will look at Muslim discoveries like this one by Al-Bayruni. A more reliable and sophisticated method for estimating the Earth's size was needed. And two centuries after Al Ma'mun died, it came. What made it possible was a great leap of imagination and the fact that by 900 AD, much of the world's mathematical knowledge had been translated into Arabic so scholars could scrutinize and improve on it. Out of this obsession with scholarly learning, came a true mathematical visionary, Abu Rayhan Muhammad ibn Ahmed al-Bayruni. And like all Islamic scholars of the time, 
al-Biruni was obsessed with the science and mathematics of the ancient Greeks, Babylonians and Indians. And because of the success of the translation movement, he had literally on his desk the great work on geometry by Euclid, Ptolemy's Almagest, the Indian text, the Sinhind, and the famous work on algebra by Al-Khawarizmi. Um. Uh, okay. Professor Chalubi has brought along the book in which El Beiruni describes how he combined algebra and geometry with some very simple and practical measurements to solve the epic problem of how to calculate the size of the Earth. Having read El Beiruni's description of how to estimate the size of the world, I wanted to try it for myself. First, he had to find a fairly high mountain from the top of which he could see a flat horizon. In this case, the sea. What I love about this story is that with a few simple measurements around this small mountain peak, you can work out the size of the whole world. Al Beiruni's first step was to work out the height of the mountain. He did this by going to two points at sea level a known distance apart and then measuring the angles from these points to the mountain top. So to measure the angle to the mountain top, Beiruni had to use a device like this called an astrolabe. It's basically a giant protractor. It has the angles and degrees marked around the outside and a pointer to help him determine his line of sight. So if we try now and determine the, the angle to the top, it has to hang freely, and then, okay, so if you let it hang. I'd like to stress, if you haven't noticed already, that Al Beruni would have made his measurements more meticulously than I am. He did them again and again to get consistently reliable results. Okay, that's about it. And that is 24 and a half degrees. Okay, so now we've determined one angle. We now have to go and pick our second spot along the beach. The distance from the first to the second point must be measured accurately. In this case, it's 100 meters, and the two points must be in a straight line with the mountain. I measured the second angle to be about 26 and a half degrees, and now had enough information to calculate the height of the mountain. Using trigonometry and algebra, El Beiruni used a formula that relates the height of the mountain to what are known as the tangents of the angles he measured. Using my measurements, I get a figure for this mountain of about 530 meters. I now need only one more measurement to get the size of the Earth. And to get that, I have to climb to the top of the mountain. What Beiruni did next was measure the angle of the line of sight to the horizon as it dips below the horizontal. So we're going to try and reproduce that. So if you can lift it up so that it's hanging. And if I locate the horizon, Okay, which is about half a degree, which is about the value that Beiruni got. Now here's the really ingenious part. Beiruni had measured four quantities, three angles and a distance. He used two of the angles and the distance to work out the height of the mountain. El Beiruni now had everything he needed. In essence, El Beiruni imagined a huge right-angled triangle which has as its three corners, the mountain top, the horizon, and the center of the earth. Trigonometry told him that the angle he had measured and the height of the mountain are related to the radius of the earth, and algebra allowed him to calculate it. With this formula, Beirun is able to arrive at a value for the circumference of the earth that's within 200 miles of the exact value we know it to be today, about 25,000 miles. That is impressive. That's to within an accuracy of less than 1%, a remarkable achievement for someone a thousand years ago. So what other scientific discoveries in Islam affect us today? Well, for example, the Babylonians, 
Not only do they have mathematical skills, but they also develop time measurement that we still recognize today. Egyptians had the first university, Al-Hazar, in Cairo in the 19th century. It was created by a woman named Fatimi. And it was the Muslims who will introduce the zero, the algebra, trigonometry into this science world. It was Nasir al-Din al-Tusi. He's a 13th century Persian whose theory on celestial motion was translated into Greek and influenced Copernicus as he developed the heliocentric theory of the solar system. It was Abu al-Qusim al-Zari known as the father of surgery, who performed uh, the first trichotomy that we know of. And uh, other Muslims will perform cataract surgeries. And uh, Abba, Abbas, Ibn Farnas, he, in the 9th century, investigated mechanics of flight, and he will make a pair of wings 600 years before Leonardo da Vinci ever did. Well, we'll answer questions like about, well, what contributions did the Muslims have, but also questions about things that more, how, what, what is the Arab Spring of 2011? Uh, what was it? And why did Arabs want to reform? Well, it was a big reform movement, but, but what did the Arabs want to reform in their countries? And in Islam, was it a good thing? Was it a bad thing? A movement for the West? Why does the Iranian regime hate America? Did you know that they loved us at one time? What's this about a cold war between Iran and Saudi Arabia? Why is there a cold war? As you know, there was a huge war, a proxy war in Syria between Iran, and maybe it knows between Iran and Saudi Arabia, but it was between other countries that were there, many countries that were fighting there, as you can see on the far right. Well, who's to blame? Who do we support here in the U.S. and why? And why do Saudis and Egyptians speak Arabic, but Turkish Muslims speak Turkish? Why do Iranian Muslims speak Persian or Farsi? And Muslim Palestinians speak Hebrew? Well, we'll read and study and discuss about countries like Saudi Arabia, Iran, Egypt, Lebanon, Morocco, Jordan, to name a few. And of course, we'll spend a day on Israel, talk about questions like, how did the Holocaust help cre create the present day uh, state of Israel? And uh, what is Zionist movement in Israel? And why did the Jews create the state of Israel in 1948? Was it ethical? What happened to the Palestinians that were living there when the Jews came to live there at the beginning of the 19th century, or 20th century, or end of 19th century? And did all misplaced Palestinians, did they end up in refugees camps? The Israeli-Palestinian conflict, we'll spend a whole day on that. What's the cause of it? Is it oppression by Israel, Palestinian terrorists? What's the correlation? Who's to blame? Why do Muslim countries hate Israel? And what is, who are the Kurds? You've probably heard of them in the media. And where's Morocco and Iran, Lebanon, Yemen, on, Yemen, on, Yemen? And what does the geography and the countryside and the villages and the cities and the landscape look like? Well, why do women cover themselves with hijabs and burqas? And why do men wear kafiyas? What are some of the food they eat? What are they, uh, like, uh, this is baklava, and uh, you actually will get to taste it in our class. This is a shish tawuk, marinated chicken shish kebab of Turkish origin and falafel. Uh, this will, we'll get to try hummus and tabula and hawarma. And of course, we'll get the opportunity to, every day before you come to class, you'll have an opportunity to upload a question. And uh, it's my goal to ask, answer many of those questions that you submit to me before I come to class. And so uh, I'm excited to teach you and to help you understand this wonderful place uh, in the Middle East and to understand these wonderful people, uh, the Arabs, and understand their religion, Islam.